do at the museum with our programs. Uh, we will stream tonight's program. Um, and so we will continue to give folks alternatives uh, to engage with the work that we're doing. So welcome to those in person and welcome to those that are engaging with us online. My name is Cam Patterson. I have the honor of serving as executive director here at the Robert Russell Moten Museum. And it's my honor to welcome you to our annual L. Francis Griffin Day Observance and Lecture. The Reverend L. Francis Griffin Observance and Lecture is held in, on or in the days leading up to Reverend Griffin's birthday, uh, which is today. Uh, and it seeks to honor the contributions of this iconic civil rights leader. The Reverend L. Francis Griffin Sr. worked here in Prince Edward County and beyond to help lead the struggle for racial equality. This observance is marked with this reflection upon the integral role that faith played in the life of the Reverend L. Francis Griffin. Reverend Griffin was known locally and nationally as the fighting preacher a civil rights advocate who helped to lead the fight for civil rights and education and was a voice of opposition to the decision by Prince Edward County to close public schools rather than integrate. I know you have his brief biography uh, before you, uh, but I certainly want to emphasize and highlight uh, some of his key contributions. Uh, Reverend Griffin, uh, educated at Shaw University, uh, held the pastorate at First Baptist Church here in Farmville, uh, succeeding his father, Reverend Charles Griffin. Uh, Reverend Griffin uh, was an actively involved uh, individual within our community. Um, we at the museum tell folks often that if you come to the museum thinking that advocacy in this community began in 1951, with the student walkout, uh, you are mistaken uh, because there were amazing examples of advocacy in this community that were taking place uh, with individuals mm -hmm. such as Martha E. Forster, Reverend L. Francis Griffin, John Lancaster, and others. Um, and so Reverend Griffin actively involved in the Parent Teacher Association, leading some of those early fights uh, to better the school conditions for individuals in Prince Edward County. Additionally, he was involved with the Prince Edward County branch NAACP and the Virginia State Conference of the NAACP. He supported the students who in 1951 went on strike as they joined the Davis case, which would become one of the five cases involved in Brown v. Board of Education. He supported um, this uh, community in opposition to the closing of public schools. Um, and he did all of this uh, with um, you know, great personal costs to his family and himself. Um, he worked to help children gain access to education through a variety of different means. Um, and it's because of his legacy um, that we were able uh, to see public education in this country saved um, in a really powerful way. And so we stand on his shoulders. Uh, we honor him uh, each day through our work at the museum, but specifically tonight with this observance. And so I do want to read uh, to you all uh, a letter that has been shared uh, by um, our senior senator from Virginia, uh, Senator Mark Warner. And it reads, dear friends, I'm pleased to extend warm greetings to the local museum and the greater community of Farmville and Prince Edward as you gather for the annual Reverend L. Francis Griffin Day observance. The observance is an opportunity to celebrate the life of a man who led the fight for school integration for African-American students in Prince Edward. Reverend Griffin was a strong proponent of civil rights and equal access to public education and when the county closed its public schools in defiance, Reverend Griffin worked to bridge the education gap for black students, helping to place many in schools around the country, creating training centers for local children, and fostering the support of the free schools in the county, 
all while continuing to push for the eventual reopening and integration of the county's public schools. He was an undeterred leader and mentor to many in his community. Today, on what would have been the Reverend's 105th birthday, we celebrate the fighting preacher, who Dr. Martin Luther King described as a giant among men. Virginia is fortunate to claim such a native, such a notable native son. And so on this important occasion, uh, we are pleased to join with you in wishing you the very best for a fulfilling celebration, Senator Mark Wood. Um, and so with that, I would like to invite uh, the Honorable A.D. Chucky Reed, the Vice Mayor of the Town of Farmville, and the Chair of our Milton Council to share a reflection. Um, and then following Mr. Reed, Kanan Townsend, our Managing Director, will introduce our speaker. Good evening. Good evening. I was asked uh, briefly to say a few words about a man that I respected and loved, the Reverend L. Francis Griffin Sr., and he was also my mentor. I was one of the students called the Lost Generation because of the five years we lost due to our school closure. I was eight years old, growing up in the neighborhood in the First Baptist Church, where I was around him quite a bit. My dad and my mom always knew where I was when we weren't playing in the neighborhood. It was like a, it was like a headquarters to us at First Baptist Church in the basement, uh, crash programs, voice newspapers, and, and in uh, learning everyday life. I cleaned his office and ran errands for him. And he always had those words of wisdom, words that encouraged me to become who I am now and others here in Prince Edward County. Reverend Griffin loved his family, his church, his people, his community. He was that man that wanted his fairness, justice, and civil rights for all. I recall when we planned our walkout in 1969, he was very instrumental in advising us on what and how we should do things. And he had done the same with other demonstrations. We don't have local leaders like him now in Prince Edward County that is as vocal, strong as he was. Dr. Martin Luther King said in his visit here in 1962, the Reverend Griffin is a giant among men. He is someone that I will never forget, a fighting preacher. Good evening, everybody. Evening. My name is Kanan Townsend, and I serve currently as the managing director for the Moat Museum. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Derek P. Alton. So Dr. Derek Aldridge is a former middle school and high school social studies and history teacher who serves as the Philip J. Gibson Professor of Education and an affiliate faculty member at the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies at the University of Virginia. An educational and intellectual historian, Aldridge's scholarship examines education in the United States with foci in African American education and the civil rights movement. His books include The Educational Thought of W.B. Du Bois, An Intellectual History, The Black Intellectual Tradition, African American Thought in the 20th Century with Neil Bynum and James B. Stewart, and Message in the Music, Hip Hop, History and Pedagogy with B.P. Franklin and James B. Stewart. All which has three new books under contract forthcoming in 2023. In 2021, Aldridge was a recipient of the Carter G. Woodson Medallion from the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. In 2019, 2020, he served as the co-chair for the Virginia Commission on African American History Education in the Commonwealth. Aldridge is the founding director of the Center for Race and Public Education in the South and a principal investigator of the Teachers in the Movement or History Project, of which we'll be discussing in, in further detail this evening. So it's my pleasure to welcome up to the podium, Dr. Derek P. Allworth. Thank you, Mr. Townsend, for your very kind introduction. I want to also uh, thank Cameron Patterson 
for his very kind invitation for me to speak with you all today. I met Cameron a few years ago, and um, we've been talking ever since. So I was, you know, pleasantly surprised when you called to ask me to ask you. <laughs> I also want to thank the individuals that I had dinner with just a few minutes ago. Of course, Cameron, Kanan, uh, Megan Clark, Chucky Reed, Mike, Mike Hutzinger, and Leo Brown. So thank you very much for uh, sharing dinner with me today. Um, I'm very happy to give this lecture, uh, and I can't think of a, a better lecture for me to give uh, than to give this particular lecture because it's in honor of Reverend L. Francis Griffin, a giant, a civil rights giant, and someone that I've heard about for a long time growing up in the small town of Rock Hill, South Carolina. So I'm happy to be here today to talk with you about the project Teachers in the Movement. You may notice, though, that I revised my title. Sometimes I do. So I sent Cameron the title Teachers in the Movement Pedagogy, um, Pedagogy, Activism, and Freedom. But I started thinking about what I want, what I really wanted to talk about, and I revised it somewhat. And its title is Oral History as Soul Work, Listening to and Retelling the Stories of Civil Rights Era Teachers. So I'll tell you in just a few minutes why I'm uh, using this particular title. So let's get started. Let us march on segregated schools until that progressive segregated and inferior education becomes the thing of the past. You will hear me use a little racism because I maintain the school for the of school, even today, a word to hinder. When they finally decided to put the schools together and move the black teachers, they reinforce what we already knew. The black teachers were the most highly educated. Everybody didn't agree with the fact that the people like this being here, they were somehow able to endure, and I'm sure it was a great deal of pressure from the outside to not play black men. The way I like to look at it is they, they played fair ball. A lot of people didn't play fair ball in those days, but on that football team, we learned how to play fair ball. In 1968, there were 122 black master classes. In the 70s, there were only 17. From that ball, I was going forward, all the students had to be prepared. And I was here as a doctor of the 70s. I found that it was all things from the truth. I was in the success. I always had two microscopes. A sixth class of students. But the term that my students would get the education that they needed to be successful. Let us march on. Okay, allow me to give you an introduction to the project. The Teachers in the Movement project started in 2014. And when we had dinner today, um, I told uh, uh, the folks eating with me that the project actually began sooner than that. It actually began in the 1980s, uh, growing up in a small town in Rock Hill, South Carolina, but actually outside of Rock Hill, South Carolina, a town called Catawba, South Carolina, at the church called Liberty Hill Baptist Church. And I will talk some about that in a few minutes, but I grew up hearing stories about these teachers. And I always wanted to do something about it. In other words, I wanted to capture their stories, even as a young person. But it wasn't until 2014 that I received a small grant uh, at the University of Virginia to get started. And we promised the university that we would conduct uh, 50 interviews in two years of um, teachers throughout the South. Uh, we, we were successful in doing that. And then we wrote another grant. My team, a team of graduate students, four graduate students, and two undergraduate students. And then we were funded by the Spencer Fund Foundation in Chicago to conduct 500 videotape interviews of teachers in southern states, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, and we wanted to focus on teachers that talk during the civil rights era. So we wanted to start in 1950, just a few years before the Brown, Brown versus Board of Education. And we wanted to go through the 1960s uh, and to the 70s, what we call the post-civil rights period. So 
Our demographic includes teachers who taught between 1950 and 1980. And these teachers are uh, primarily African-American teachers, but we interview all teachers who were involved in activism in the civil rights movement as educators. Um, to date, last I checked yesterday, we had 302 interviews. Um, we have 100, 200 more that we need to conduct by next December. Um, so why are we why are we doing this research? And that's a question that I want to I want to pose. When I got to graduate school, and I start talking about these teachers that I grew up with in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and how they were uh, for us, they were the black public intellectual before we had uh, people like Cornel West. Michael Eric Dyson and others. The people that we looked up to in my community were the black teachers, the coaches, the teachers, the teachers who uh, directed the choir, the band directors, all of those, those were our heroes. But when I got to graduate school, school and became interested in studying uh, the role of teachers in the civil rights movement, I could not find those teachers, believe it or not. Some historians argue in the text that teachers were kind of sort of involved in the civil rights movement, but they didn't do much protest out the streets, right? They weren't carrying signs and picking, they weren't doing that. They were on the sidelines. Some scholars, at least one, I won't name that person, uh, but argued that not only were teachers on the sidelines, some were complicit in maintaining segregation for fear that when black schools shut down, black teachers will lose their job. Unfortunately, that did happen in some cases. That's documented by historians. So this was a major problem for me because it didn't square with what I heard growing up in my hometown. Because the teachers that I heard about were not only activists on the pig farms or in the movement out in the streets, so to speak, but they were also considered activists in their classrooms by way of their pedagogy. So there has been some recent research that has challenged um, the thesis of prior historians. One of the books that really changed things for me and lined up with what I heard growing up was a book by Vanessa Silva Walker, The Highest Potential in African American School Community in the Segregated South, <laughs> dropped in 1996. And Dr. Walker studied Caswell County Training School in North Carolina. And she didn't make the argument that these teachers were activists, so to speak, but it was very easy to read between the lines that they were activists, including the legendary principal at the high school, Caswell County Training High School, uh, named Mr. Dillard, who was a graduate of Shaw University, was also my fraternity brother, I should put that out there, but he was legendary. And um, so that book changed, changed things for me. Another book is by R. Scott Baker, which is about teachers in Charleston, South Carolina, who were involved not only in the movement in terms of being activists out there with their students, but also they were pedagogical activists, Baker artists. My colleague, um, Tundra Loder Jackson, produced a book a few years ago, Schoolhouse Activists, African-American Educators and the Long Birmingham Civil Rights Movement, took the argument to another level. She actually introduced me to this term called pedagogical activism, which basically was the idea that teachers were activists by how they taught and what they taught. If these teachers promulgate ideas of democracy and equality in the classroom, were they training a new generation of civil rights activists? And the answer was yes. So Jackson's work, Loder Jackson's work has really helped frame uh, our project in many ways. And then this book that just came out in 2001, which is 
if you're interested in the history of teachers, all of these are great books. But this one is a new one uh, by a scholar by the name of Jarvis Gibbons called Fugitive Pedagogy. Carter G. Woodson and the Art of Black Teaching. And what Gibbons does is he examines the roles of teachers in their classroom in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And he also shows that Carter G. Woodson, the historian Carter G. Woodson, was very instrumental in these teachers' intellectual development. And that Woodson corresponded with these teachers. And these teachers corresponded with Woods. So you had these behind the scenes kinds of activities occurring between uh, African American teachers, Carter G. Woodson, and Carter G. Woodson's association, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, now African American Life and History. So these are just a few of the texts or studies that have um, influenced our work. And there are more coming out every year. So the beginnings of this project, I want to go back to that. As I said, I grew up in this little church. It was the location of the Liberty Hill Golden Wall School in Catawba, South Carolina. Unfortunately, I just found that out a few years ago, right? I didn't know this growing up. But it was in this very small church that we had some legendary teachers. One of those teachers was a woman named Cynthia Claire Roddy. Cynthia Blairotti desegregated uh, Winthrop College in 1964, and she was the pianist in my church. So this just gives you an idea of the people that I grew up with. Later in my church was um, a woman named Bertha Maxwell Wright. If you are a member of Delta Sigma Theta, you might know that she was the national president of, of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. And then there was, of course, my mother, who was a teacher, who grew up in this community as well. And I heard many of her stories. So I traced the beginnings of this project or my desire to study teachers and then activism during the movement back to the 1970s and 1980s in this church right here. But something else happened, too, that helped me think about how to conceptualize the study. And that was in January of 1961, a group of students at the local Friendship Community College in Rock Hill, South Carolina, decided that they would march on the McCrory's Five and Dime store in Market, downtown. And they had already decided, because they had been in contact with SNCC, they were working with SNCC in Atlanta, that they were not going to pay their bill. They were actually going to be arrested, and they were not going to pay their bill. And that's what they did. And these are the gentlemen over here on the right, a few of them. And when they did not pay their bill, they had to go to the York County prison camp, which is near Rock Hill. And they actually did 30 days on the chain gang. And, you know, I've interviewed some of these gentlemen, and they, the stories are just incredible. But one thing that was fascinating about it was that all of them, um, some of them didn't even consider themselves activists, right? They said, I was just doing what we thought was right. So that's something I had to keep in the back of my mind as I began to think about these, these teachers. I had to sit back and think, think about how, well, all of these teachers identify themselves as activists. I'm going to talk about that. So one of these teachers was very, and one of these gentlemen, was very influential to me growing up. And that's the man sitting down on the right. His name is William Doug Massey. He's legendary. He was a uh, elementary school counselor, but he was one of the main leaders of the Friendship Nine. He had a legendary career from the 1960s on through uh, the 1990s in Rock Hill as both a pedagogical activist, but as an activist for what some would call a hellraiser in my community. <laughs> so I'm sure y'all know someone like that. <laughs> so uh, this was you know, a very pivotal point in my study as well. And so I was asked today at dinner, where, where are you doing your interviews? Where are you conducting your interviews? Well, these are the talents. 
I mean the states, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Why are these states? Why not Mississippi, Alabama? Why not other southern states? For that matter, northern states, midwestern states. I could give y'all a very smart answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just gonna tell it, be very just tell it like it is. When I applied for my grant, they told me you can't do more than five states. <laughs> you need to make a decision. So I decided to uh, uh, select the state that I either lived in or that I had family members in, right? And they said, well, that's good. You got to take it another step. I, or you just can't say it's just because it's convenient. I said, you know what? How about this? Typically, when we think about the civil rights movement, we think about Mississippi, Alabama, and Arkansas. Let's look at some states that have a very rich civil rights history, but would not rate, would not come to the level of what people think about what happened in Mississippi, Alabama, and Arkansas. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay, that's what I they both. But you know what I found interesting about uh, going to these different states is sometimes we go to large cities. And other times we go to small, uh, small towns. And wherever we go, there seems to be, the stories seem to be very similar in terms of, um, you know, teachers' activism in the movement. So one of the questions that I've been asked in doing this work, and I was prepared for this, uh, when I was in graduate school and then as an assistant professor, when I would talk about uh, my desire to study these teachers, and I was doing some preliminary work on some other related issues, one of the questions that I was always asked at these conferences, particularly at history conferences, was this. Professor Albert, you're talking about these black teachers in your community. How can you, as an African-American male, be objective when you're talking about people in your own community? Oh, interesting question. Uh, that was one question. Another question was, um, how can you study what teachers did in the past? Take it from the past and inform what teachers are doing today. That's called, among historians, a fallacy of presentism. That was another question. And after some time, I was talking to a good colleague of mine named Professor Jerome Morris. I said, how do I respond to these questions? I don't know. You know, how do I respond to them? I don't have anything really, you know, to, to say that will kind of keep these other scholars off. He said, why don't you write an article about it, get it published, and then cite yourself. So I did just that. <laughs> and in 2003, I published an article our article called The Dilemmas, Dilemmas, Challenges, and Duality of an African-American Educational Historian. And I, promote, I uh, uh, promoted several ideas in this article. And one was this idea of the same of Saint Kofa, or the same Kofa birth. Whenever I would get this question about how can you take the past and inform the present? And how can you, uh, yeah, how can you take the past and inform the present? I would always say, I'm using the concept of Sankofa, which means going back to the past and bringing forth that which is useful, so to inform the present. And that, that, and, and, and that was something that um, I hadn't thought about until talking with you. And so this one has been very helpful for me to think about. So that's what informs our work. When we're interviewing teachers in 1964 in Danville, Virginia, talking about uh, what they taught in the classroom and how they taught it, the challenges they're facing. We're constantly thinking about the challenges the classroom teachers are facing in today's classroom. And the best example I can give you of that is someone I'm going to show you later, a woman named Laverne Spurlock. We brought to the University of Virginia. She was a teacher, uh, a guidance counselor at Maggie Walker uh, in the 1960s. And we brought her back and had her converse with some teachers today you wouldn't have known the difference in the time periods they were teaching. 
they talked about their students the same way. And so that was very comforting for us to hear that the past can certainly inform the present. We also view ourselves as interviewers, as um, keeper of the keeper of stories and as a storyteller. And that comes under the concept of the griot. So where did I get this concept of the griot? Well, I recall watching something in 1977. I'm dating myself, that's cool. And it was Roots. Do y'all remember that episode from Roots with the griot? Anyone, anyone not remember? It's powerful. In the cons, in, in, in here, Alex Haley actually goes back to the west coast of Africa uh, looking for his uh, ancestor, Kunta Kinte. And he was told that he needed to talk to the local storyteller, Agria. And so he eventually found Agria and he wanted to know about the family, the Kunta Kinte family, and this person called Kunta Kinte who went out looking for materials to build a drum because Alex Haley had heard that story growing up in Tennessee. And they said, it doesn't work like that. You got to go and listen to the storyteller, and he's got to tell the story of your people. And then at some point, you may hear the same story that you heard growing up in Tennessee. Well, surely that happened. And he heard the story, same story he heard growing up in Tennessee. And you now, need to put this out there. Some scholars challenge whether or not that actually happened. The biggest story, and I have to put that out there. Nonetheless, it's a beautiful story. It's a story that certainly um, has informed us when we think about what we're doing. And just, just to give you an example of this kind of thing, we interview uh, teachers sometimes, and their parent, I mean, their children or their grandchildren will bring them to the interview. And while we're interviewing their parents or grandparents, They'll tell us something that the kids, the children have never heard. I'm thinking about one case where a uh, we're interviewing this couple, and the man said, "For a year, I stopped teaching. I went to New York to pursue uh, my uh, career as a tailor. It didn't work, and I came back and got my teaching job." The kids never heard that story, and they almost stopped the interview. So a lot of things come out, and so what ha happens with the GRIO, the GRIO allows these stories to come forth. So we keep that in mind whenever we're doing uh, our interviews. So Mr. James Wright, whenever I give my talk on this project, I always say, maybe I should take James Wright. I do James Wright every time, but I can never not talk about James Wright. James Wright um, is from Columbia, South Carolina, and he taught school. He got his first teaching job in 1971 at Eau Claire High School in Columbia, South Carolina, shortly after it had desegregated. Prior to that, Mr. Wright was in Vietnam. Uh, prior to that, he was at South Carolina State, where he studied social studies and education. But he decided to go to Vietnam, and when he got there, he said that it was time to come home. He, he, wanted, he wanted to get back home. So he wrote Senator Fritz Hollins. Have you ever heard of Fritz Hollins? The Democratic senator from South Carolina in the early 70s. He received no correspondence whatsoever. He said, well, hey, let me just try to write a strong term. I know I'm not going to hear from him, but I'm going to do it. So he wrote Strom Thurmond a letter. A few weeks later, he gets a letter saying that you're coming back home. And it was from Strom Thurmond. I said, are you sure? It was from Strom Thurmond. <laughs> and so people often ask me, what surprises you about the interviews that you conduct, about the, the, the stories you hear? There are all kinds of things like that that happen all the time. I said, do you know why he did that? He said, that's another story. And then he did tell me, and you know, I can't, it's a long story, but it's a very interesting story. So we learned that. So I want you to hear a little bit of the interview that we did with Mr. Wright. And whenever I show this interview, people tell me, hey, I know Mr. Wright. I said, you actually know Mr. Wright? They said, 
I know a Mr. Wright. And I want you to see if you know Mr. Wright. <laughs> materials dating back to his papers that he wrote at South Carolina State in 1960. <laughs> he had letters from his teachers, kept all of this stuff. And the entire floor, we were walking around it like this because the entire floor had all the books that he had read and that he drew from. And, it worked. and he still is reading now. And he still sent me stuff. Text me, uh, yeah, text me letters and all kinds of things. Then he took me downstairs to my to his basement, and there were walls and walls of books. And so uh, I asked Mr. Wright, I said, Mr. Wright, are you a you consider your yourself as an activist? Were you an activist? He said, Yes. Black history was my weapon. And by the way, I told him I need to take that statement and make it the title of a book chapter or something that I was writing because I like that black history as a weapon. And one of the things that I hear people talking about now is culturally relevant teaching and culturally relevant pedagogy. And uh, you know, 
the educator Lori Lassen Billings has done an excellent job of developing that as a concept. But I believe she would argue, and I would argue, that black teachers during this period were already doing what we consider culturally relevant teaching or culturally relevant pedagogy, right? So my idea is, what if we can get Mr. Wright in conversation with these teachers today? How powerful would that be? Laverne Spurlock. I learned about Laverne Spurlock from her daughter. Her daughter was uh, a member of the foundation board for the School of Education at the University of Virginia. And she said, you may want to interview my mother. And so we called her and we did interview her. And one of the things that I noticed, we've interviewed her three times, by the way, and Mr. Wright four times. Um, one of the things that I noticed when we interview teachers is typically when they come to the interview, they're dressed up. <laughs> and so I so had to tell my, my research team, you got to come dressed up because this is a different tradition. All right? So when we go to the interviews, when we, when we set up these interviews, typically the men will have on shirt, tie, or suit, and women will have on dresses. So I used to ask, um, I asked Dr. Spurlock once, why, why was it? Well, I said, when I look at the photo albums of the 1950s and 60s, did people really dress like that? She said, yes. And they carried themselves a certain way, too. And she talks about that here, about how a teacher uh, should carry themselves and how they carried themselves during her time as a guidance counselor at Maggie Walker in Richmond. <laughs> Around the fashion all the time. 
brought um, Dr. Spurlock back um, and three other teachers and had an event for an event for them in the rotunda at the University of Virginia and we invite, invited teachers uh, from around the state to come in and it was a very emotional experience. <laughs> uh, the teachers talked about the difficulty in getting the children to listen they talked about children having, you know, some of the children not wanting to learn history uh, in particular. That was a topic they didn't want to learn. And they said, how do we reach these children, uh, Dr. Spurlock? And she said, well, I'll tell you what I did. And she said, the first thing you have to do, you must always try to reach all of them, but there will be one or two students in the class that will want to learn. She said, focus on them. She said, once the other students see, see you focusing on them and giving them that attention, they will gravitate towards you, right? And she said, it may not work all the time, but it, was, it worked for us. And she said, just take this one rule to teaching when it comes to if, you, if you're struggling. And it's like, if you only can reach one, reach that one, but always strive to reach all, right? But if you only reach one, reach that one. And that was something that uh, resonated with, with the educators. And so Dr. Spurlock also talked about how teachers carry themselves, how they dress. And that brought me to something, uh, kind of something that I'm going to have to struggle with when I begin to write my book based on this, on this data. And that is some of our younger scholars, not just younger scholars, have, uh, they talk about this concept of respectability politics or the politics of respectability. The politics of respectability is the idea that black people, particularly during the early part of the 20th century, tried to dress a certain way, carry themselves a certain way in order to get respect in the larger society, in, in terms of white, the white society, right? And, um, I've asked a few of my teachers that we've interviewed, what, what do you think about that as, as a concept? Do you, you all think you were engaging in some form of respectability politics? And they would say, I've never heard the term, but they said, let me explain something to you. Our teachers represented us, and they needed to dress like that. They needed to carry themselves. And it made us proud of them, and it made us want to be like that, right? And they said, and that's just what we did. And so, um, yeah, thinking about her comments about the teacher that she admired really resonated with me as I began to grapple with this concept of respectability politics. So these are just two um, 
I'm not going to do this one. Okay. What are our preliminary findings? As I mentioned earlier, we have 302 interviews are conducted. We have uh, four graduate students and I thought it was two, but now I think we have four undergraduate students working with us and a postdoctoral student that's working with us. And we're interviewing every day, all day, trying to get to this, to get those two other, other interviews. But we are already able to come to some preliminary conclusions based on what we discovered. And I should also add that these teachers are also sharing their own personal collections, their papers, some of them have their grade books, their lesson plans, they share that with us too. Um, and one of the things we found is that some teachers did not identify themselves as activists. And we had to be careful because we're going in, teachers in the movement, teachers in the movement, do you identify yourself as an activist? Nope. I was just doing a good job. I wanted to do a good job. I wanted to be a good teacher. Um, others might say, well, how you, how you define an activist? And I said, teachers that promoted, promulgated ideas of democracy, equality, inclusion in the classroom, right? In that case, I might be an activist. And then you have teachers like Mr. Wright who says, yes, I was an activist. Um, so I would argue that because of that, on the whole, teachers did practice a form of pedagogical activism. That's built on the work of Tantra Lola Jackson. As we said earlier, with people like Mr. Wright, they used a form of what we today call culturally relevant uh, pedagogy and curriculum to teach about the movement. And one that I found very powerful when I talk to people today, when I talk to young people today, is that our teachers were the public intellectuals. Whatever you need to know about, ask a teacher. I remember my grandfather, this is the story that I heard, used to ask my mother, who was a first grade teacher, if she didn't know something, couldn't believe it. He said, aren't you a teacher? <laughs> and he, he, he said, he said, I'm sending you to school to Benedict College in South Carolina to become a teacher. <laughs> that means to him, you are an intellectual. So he grew up with that concept that teachers were intellectuals. And so we still tell that story in our, in our family. So these are some, some of the early conclusions that we've um, drawn from our work. What are some of the outcomes? Uh, every summer, we hold a Summer Teachers Institute. These, this is from, I think, summer 19, where we brought teachers in to engage with our um, Teachers in the Movement participants. Uh, we'll have a repository of 500 videotaped interviews. Now you can visit um, our website, teachersinthemovement.com. We have about 50 uh, interviews that you can access. You can use them uh, for your research purposes. Uh, of course, this third one in here, I should have I didn't mean to leave that in there, but whenever I give this talk at UVA, I have that one. <laughs> Enhance the relationship between UVA and local communities. Uh, enhance our historical understanding of the roles of teachers in American society. Uh, encourage students to career, pursue a career in teaching. Uh, we're already using these interviews for that purpose. Um, I've received calls from uh, different organizations around the country who are encouraging African-Americans to pursue teaching and they're using our database already, so we're happy about this. And last will be to pursue, produce volumes, including interviews from the project. All right, so before I close down here, I just wanna talk about why do I call this work soul work? I've gone through and showed you what, did anyone have an idea my, why I decided to call this project soul work? I wish I could say it came up but I did not. I was given this presentation or one similar to it in Lynchburg about a year ago. And a woman in the audience raised her hand and she said she was 95 years old. And she said, I was a teacher. And she said, you and your team are doing important work. It's more than research. I said, it's spirit work, it's soul work. Continue to do it. And on my drive back to Charlottesville, I kept thinking about this. What is she talking about? Spirit work, soul work. And so that really stuck with me. So every day I get up, I think about that, that I want to capture some more stories of some more teachers. And then I thought about something like that. I haven't interviewed my 84-year-old mother who talked for 40 years. 
So I said, I'm coming down there anyway. So I interviewed her. And so this work has been very important to me. I consider it my life's work. I'm going to continue to try to capture these stories so that they are there for posterity for other people to study, use in their classrooms, and use for research purposes. So where do we go from here? Um, one of my uh, editors called me and said, hey, this teacher's in the movement project right when all the critical race theory stuff occurred, right? This project is speaking to this current moment. My knee-jerk reaction was, no, I don't want to get into that because that's, you know, I don't want to try to use the past to inform the present. Still struggling with that, right? But then I said, oh, no, no, no. This is a perfect time. These teachers are speaking to this current moment. They were speaking at a more, they were teaching during a more contentious period and during a more transformative period than we are now, I would argue, right? And so who better to inform today's teachers than the teachers of the past, the teachers who taught during the civil rights era? Thank you. And I can do some Q&A if you want. I have a question for you. So, um, you know, nationally, as we grapple with um, an issue with uh, an exodus from the classroom, what are the lessons that we can glean, you know, from, you know, teachers of the past in terms of how we might move forward? Yeah, so we've been thinking a lot, of, a lot about that. Like, we think that the luster that teaching once had in the black community, uh, we would argue started um, going in a different direction, probably in the late 1970s, early 1980s. We just That's just something we learned from talking to people. For instance, um, some of the teachers that we interviewed who were teaching in the 60s were still teaching in the uh, early 80s. And they told us, you know why I left the classroom? because of the working condition, but the answer we get every time is standardized testing. I can't mm -hmm. teach anymore. Mm -hmm. When I was teaching at such and such high school or such and such middle school, you know, I could be an intellectual. I could be an artist with my students. I could do these things, but now it's the test, right? And so I think that's what they have identified as the reason, the reasons that they left the teaching profession. They could, they could have stayed in longer. So I think the working conditions um, are, are a problem. And I don't know how yet, to answer your question, how we're going to leverage these interviews to encourage folks to pursue degrees in education when we're in such a hostile environment right now with, with teachers. So if anyone has an idea of how we can leverage this kind of research to do that, I think it's important for them to know what teachers did if they're already in the classroom. They can, uh, you know, these teachers are talking about the pedagogy in, in, in our, what books they use, how they talk. And I think that's very important. And I think that could, that could help maybe keep people in the classroom. And I might argue that we know almost nothing about what teachers taught, uh, how teachers talked on the civil rights movement. And I asked, my teachers, I said, why do you think we, we don't know? And they all said, because no one ever asked us. No one cares about what we were doing during the movement. We always gravitate to the most well-known civil rights figures. No one asked about it. So I was shocked that no one had asked. So. Well, look around the room, and I'm disappointed that more education majors are not here tonight. Yeah. What do you think? <clears throat> those going into education today could learn? And where do you think we are lacking with our education departments in preparing teachers um, for today? Yeah. Well, I might get in trouble for this because <laughs> it's going to make me offer a critique of the ed school that I work in. And, you know, we need to give our prospective teachers, our future teachers, the curriculum they will need 
to teach kids in the various demographics that they'll be teaching, right? For instance, in 2017, I received an inbox to my Facebook from one of my former students who told me that she was teaching in Chicago and she's from Virginia, South Virginia. And she says, I do not know what I'm doing in this classroom. I don't know what I'm teaching. I don't know how to teach these children. And she was the kind of person who wanted to do good. She was a white, white woman. And so that really hit me. And so, uh, you know, I gave her some suggestions and, and I still stay in touch with it. But you can be an education major and not take a course in African American history, although we know you're going to be teaching African American children. You can be an education major and not have a course on any of the other uh, ethnic groups, history or culture, and get a degree from most schools of education. So the challenge is changing it, changing the curriculum and making students have to take these courses, not giving them a choice of taking, you know, a history course or a particular history course or book. Give them diversity courses that they, they, they can take. And I think just that's a small step, but I think the curriculum needs to be revamped. And I don't know, I'm sure they don't have that problem here at Longwood. I don't know. Well, um, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you, Dr. Ulrich. Um, you know, it's pretty neat, you know, when folks come in the museum uh, to engage with the permanent exhibit, you really can't tell uh, the civil rights story of Prince Edward County without uh, talking about the significance of Black educators here in Prince Edward County. Um, the mentorship and the guidance that you know black educators offer to our students uh, the way in which students looked up to them uh, you know just the notion that in the midst of all they were seeking to do uh, regarding their experience and circumstance uh, at the center of it was this desire to protect uh, those individuals that we care deeply about so uh, you know, we thank you uh, for your presentation tonight. Uh, we do have some refreshments, and we'll continue to engage for some conversation. Thank you. All right. Thank you.